Oklahoma, Nebraska. One of the best rivalries in the history of college football, folks. Um, and if you grew up like I did in the Denver, Colorado area or in the old Big 8 footprint, this was, let's face it, an all due respect to the CU Nebraska rivalry, but this was the rivalry at times in all of college football. Game of the century in the 70s, Johnny Rogers, the punt return, uh, tore them loose from their shoes, epic call. Even last year's game, I mean, like this was where the national championship was won and lost for the better part of, you know, 15 years and or or longer. And and just two programs with so much history. And now they come into this game after kind of uh, scheduling these home and homes in the non-conference in two very different places, obviously. I mean, the stark difference with what's going on at Oklahoma and what's going on at Nebraska is 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 wild and I can't wait to get up there. Okay, so first and foremost, you have to understand that this is a game that there's probably more going on off the field than there is on the field. There are some games like last week, man, it's just like on the field. Here it is, who's going to win? Bama best Texas in an epic matchup, and then you kind of move forward from there. That's most games. In fact, almost every single game. You just lay it out on the field, and there you have it. This game is so much different because of all the underlying stories. Obviously, you've got the historic rivalry, which I just talked about. But then you get into the fact that from the OU perspective, you've got this new coach and this new style of football that you're going to have to be okay with being in tight ball games in the first half. You know, Listen, that wasn't comfortable in the first half against Kent State last week for a number of different reasons, but it wasn't comfortable. This is a different style of football that they're having to get used to under Brent Venables. This is a totally new adjust adjustment for Sooner fans. Now, a welcomed adjustment. When you talk with Sooner fans, they love it. They love Brent Venables. They think Lincoln Riley is a snake, and they think that this is going to be the path in which they not only return to the playoff, but potentially win a playoff game because they feel like they're going to have a better defense. More on that in a little bit. But the other side of this that I think is so fascinating is the speed with which Oklahoma has developed this really positive chemistry on their team. Now, normally you could say with a with a popular hire like Venables was, there's a honeymoon period, but this is well past the honeymoon period. Now, we've got games going on, and I am surprised because of, of what history would tell us about how fast the buy-in has taken place at OU. What are the reasons why OU has great chemistry under Brent Venables? Well, I believe that there's three reasons. First and foremost, this guy was an immensely popular hire within the fan base, within the alums, and within uh, the, the locker room, in part because of his track record at Clemson and also his track record at Oklahoma. He had both going for him. So you win the modern athlete in the locker room because of his success at Clemson. This guy's won national championships. They've seen it. He's done it at the highest level. But he also has the fan base and the alumni. Why? Because he coached at Oklahoma. So he's got this, this unique blend of new and old, which allows him to come in with, with positive momentum right from the start. So that's number one. Number two is the structure of college football. It's totally different now. In the past, what you would have seen is a coach would have said, and, and many have said this to me over the years, hey, Joel, it takes me two or three years to really turn over the locker room and to get my guys in here. Well, that's no longer the case. The transfer portal allows you to do two things. One, bring in the guys that you know are going to be committed to you. They're choosing you. They're your players. You can get a number of them, any number of them, right? We've seen Mel Tucker do that at Michigan State, and certainly Oklahoma did that in the transfer portal this year. But it also does something under the surface, which is the guys that aren't sure about you and that aren't bought in can be shown the door immediately. They can show themselves the door and leave the program. And so you've got this underlying issue with the structure of college football, which allows Brent Venables to get his team in that locker room much quicker than in the past. And then the third reason is they're seeing the success on the field. This is a coach that comes, as a, it comes in as a defensive-oriented coach, and the defense right away – is showing signs of improvement. Tenth in college football in scoring defense. They're getting after the quarterback. 
these guys feel like this is trending in the right direction. So Venables comes in, and right now it's a combination of honeymoon phase and positive chemistry that are born of all of those structural things. So that's going on as Oklahoma comes on, uh, co- goes up to Lincoln to take on Nebraska. And then you have the Nebraska angle, an absolute dumpster fire. That's not a knock, okay? And I'm not trying to be hyperbolic, and this is not an old Colorado quarterback taking a shot at the Cornhuskers. It's the truth. When you fire your coach after the third game, it's a dumpster fire. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So Mickey Joseph gets the interim job, and this is not an easy task for Mickey Joseph. He's got to try to retain some level of buy-in and discipline from the current players and buy-in and discipline from, and this is the tough part, his own staff. These are not his guys. These guys are looking... And, and their wives are asking them, and their families asking them, where are we going to be next year? I don't know. What are we going to do next year? Where are you going to coach? Who do you know? Where are the openings going to be? The distractions for the coaching staff alone are immense. They're immeasurable of what's going on at Nebraska. So all of that is going on. Meanwhile, Trev Alberts is desperately trying to retain some positive flow with the fan base trying to retain this sellout streak, which is well over 300. They're not sold out for for some Big Ten games uh, later this year. They've got upwards of 3,000 tickets available. They've been sold out every game dating back to like the early 70s. They're not sold out for some of these Big Ten games. Sold out this week for Oklahoma. Someone's going to have to step up and buy those tickets or one of the most storied sellout streaks in all of football pro or college, is going to end. And I know Nebraska fans don't want that to end. So Trev Alvers is trying to retain some positivity by saying, like, there's a new direction coming. Nebraska fans, players, and coaches, it's going to be so tough to actually focus on the game. Who's my leader if I'm a coach? Where am I going to be next year if I'm an assistant coach? Trev Alberts, can I sell the tickets? Can I retain the fan base? All of this is going on, and guess what? We still have to play a game. <laughs> this is so what's what's so bizarre about this game. I can't remember doing a game that there was this many storylines off the field and the ones on the field almost pale in comparison. Almost pale in comparison to what's going on around the fringes. Now on the on the field, here's just a quick synopsis of of what's gone wrong with Nebraska. Nebraska is playing horrific defense. They would tell you that, and they've got a good coordinator. Eric Chenander is a good coordinator. They were really good last year. That's part of the problem. Their biggest problem is that they underestimated the impact that some of the losses in personnel were going to have on this defense. They had guys that were veteran guys on that defense a year ago that played really well, by the way, and in tight, really good ball games against great teams like Michigan and Ohio State, and they had guys that would show out. And maybe they weren't superstars, but they were veteran players, and they knew how to play well. Guys like JoJo Doman, Cam Taylor Britt, who was a draft pick, um, Damian Daniels, he was a good player, Martel Dismukes, the safety, Dante Williams, Ben Stilley. Every one of these guys was either a fourth, fifth, or, or sixth-year senior. So the leadership and quality play from these guys is gone, and they underestimated – the contributions that they gave a year ago. So now their offense is fine. Their offense is averaging over 30 points a game and in large respect has played well enough to be 3-0, and but their defense hasn't matched it. They scored over 40 points at home against Georgia Southern and lost. Okay, So the losses for them on that defensive side have been staggering and tough to overcome. They've got to get better on the defensive side. Now OU on the field. Their offense is will continue to get better. I'm not as concerned about the first half struggles last week against Kent State. One of the reasons is, one, you've got a new staff that's trying this new marriage. A guy like Bill Biedenboe, who's the offensive line coach, who's trying to marry with with Jeff Lebby and his style. And it will, and it will get there. And there's a a, a real positive sentiment, at least in, in my eyes, because of the way that they adjusted and played well in the second half. Remember, they did not run the ball well against Kent State early. Then they had well over 100 yards just in the second half alone on the ground. Part of that, by the way, is because Kent State plays a very unique structure of defense, 
and OU wasn't quite sure what they were going to get from Kent State. So they had to feel it out in the first half. They play this stack defense, and rather than bore you with the intricacies of the stack defense, it's very hard for the offensive linemen to get their count right. And their count is paramount to make the calls necessary to make that run game go. Once they ended up targeting it, knowing what they were seeing, then they started running the ball really well. The most improvement that we've seen from OU is on the defensive side. And that's obviously where Brent Venables is focusing because they're playing great defense. And folks, if they can play great defense, if they can continue to be explosive on offense, then this is a team, I've said it before and I'll say it again, that is the favorite in the Big 12. Even with the way that Texas played against Alabama last week, Oklahoma would still be my favorite in the Big 12. The Big 12 still has to go through the Oklahoma Sooners, and in particular with the way that they have been playing on defense. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoy that clip, make sure you click subscribe somewhere down here. From game highlights to exclusive interviews and rankings, we've got everything you need as a college football fan right here, College Football on Fox.